Puro. What is Puro? Well, it's a shortened term for Japanese pro wrestling, Puroresu. Today, we'll be talking about the foundations of the very first promotion in Japan, the JWA, the Japan Pro Wrestling Association. And just a disclaimer before we continue, please forgive me if I mispronounce anything. While European and American pro wrestling had humble beginnings with men's clubs at carnivals in the late 1800s, Japanese wrestling was different. Japan was under American occupation after World War II. The occupation made strict rations on the nation, such as luxury goods and food. These limitations would unfortunately create a new market for the Yakuza, the Mafia of Japan. The morale of the Japanese people were low. But there were activities and entertainment that was working for the populace, like Kamishibai, which is a small street theater with illustrated boards and all that, and baseball. But there was one form of entertainment from America that was probably the most important at this time, pro wrestling. In pro wrestling, one of the most classic stories is the local hero defeating the evil foreigner. The Japanese wrestling scene had two of these local heroes to represent them at the very first show. The judo champion Masahiko Kimura and the sumo Riki Doza. But to know about the JWA, we have to learn about Riki Doza. Because the first decade of the promotion's history is entirely built around this one man. Riki Doza was actually a Korean named Kim Sin Rak trained to be a sumo in Nagasaki, but faced prejudice from the Japanese committees due to his Korean heritage. Kim proceeded to renounce his nationality and change his name to Mitsuhiro Momota, but it didn't change much for the sport of sumo. Momota, under his ring name Rikidozan, attained success but couldn't pass the rank of Sekewake. This rank is the highest you can get based on merit, but to get to the next ranks, he had to get promoted through tournament performances and the discretion of the sports governing body. Momota knew that Sumo put a glass ceiling on him, so he left Sumo for pro wrestling. He was trained by, believe it or not, Harold Sakata, a Japanese American pro wrestler who went by the ring name Tosh Togo. But his most famous accomplishment for most of us was his performance as Odd Job in the Bond film Goldfinger. And another man named Bobby Bruns, who all I could find on him was that he was a Freemason. He would be sent to Hawaii and the Pacific Northwest to hone his skills before being brought back to Japan as a patriotic icon. And with the help of printed media broadcasts, it worked. Ricky Dozan, with the help of Nick Zepetti, would form the JWA as the Japanese territory for the NWA in 1953. But its first show would be taking place on February 19, 1954, according to cagematch.net. Ricky Dozan and Masahiko Kimura main evented the show against Ben and Mike the Sharp Brothers in a two out of three falls match for the NWA World Tag Team titles in a time limit draw. The matches of the Japanese heroes fighting off the evil foreigners not only brought fans in droves to the arenas, but crowds to every television available in the country, even the sets on sale in electronic stores were crowded when Ricky Dozan had a match televised. The promotion was making a big profit, even getting more and more NWA representatives to travel over to Japan to help out the promotion, such as Lou Thez, Dara Singh, Haystacks Calhoun, Killer Kowalski, and The Destroyer in the upcoming years. Outside the ring, Ricky Dozan even became a movie star in the likes of El Santo, where he played himself, and even had a couple records as a recording artist. Because of the highs that he'd never achieved before, Ricky Dozan surrounded himself in luxury and drink. He also became overly protective of his spot on the card. 
similar to many wrestlers before and after him. The money men who were brought in by Nick Zapetti didn't help matters either, since they had connections to the Yakuza. In fact, many practices the Yakuza use today were adopted through Nick Zapetti, who coincidentally was a mobster. Another little fun fact about Nick Zapetti, he also introduced pizza to Japan, and those pizzerias became a hideout for many Yakuza and their schemes. One of the ideas the money men threw on the dartboard for Ricky Dozan was to start a series with Masahiko Kimura over the newly created Japanese heavyweight title. The first match of the series took place on December 22nd, 1954. And the match started out normally, but a botch ruined everything. Kimura made a hasty kick that went further from its intended target, where it hit Ricky Dozan's groin. He took the botched kick as a vindictive move and promptly entered a shoot on Kimura with palm strikes and kicks. Ricky Dozan became Japan's first ever heavyweight champion, but at the cost of a year-long plan. In fact, all three of JWA's singles titles were held by him. The only title that had changed hands during the JWA's first 10 years was its tag team titles. Masahiko Kimura, a judo champion that defeated Helio Gracie, the patriarch of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, with an arm lock that is now named after him, the Kimura Lock, would leave the JWA and create his own promotion, the International Pro Wrestling Force, IPWF. It did not last long and would be absorbed by the JWA, but the IPWF brought Lucha Libre to Japan for the first time. Despite the loss of Kimura, Ricky Dozan was drawing in the crowds and killing it in the ratings. While he was the ace of the promotion, he also aided in training the prospects that would lead the JWA in the future. Two of these prospects, Shohei Baba and Kanji Anoki, would be tantamount to JWA's future and Puloresu in general. The dealings with the Yakuza after the Kimura incident became more prevalent, especially when Ricky Dozan kept opening nightclubs in Yakuza territory. On December 8, 1963, at a nightclub in Asakusa, Ricky Dozan was stabbed by Katsuji Murata, a member of the Sumi Yoshikai Yakuza. According to witnesses, it began when Murata stepped on Ricky Dozan's shoe while he was talking to a woman and demanded an apology from Murata, which the latter refused. They began to argue until Murata pulled out a knife, which made Ricky Dozan attempt a negotiation of letting bygones be bygones, only for Murata to refuse, which led to him getting punched in the face numerous times. During the battering, Murata stabbed Ricky Dozan in the abdomen and fled the scene while Ricky Dozan stepped away to recover. Witness stories differ on if he continued partying or went straight to the Sano Hospital that centered around gynecology, based on the fact that a friend of his worked there and could keep the story from appearing in the tabloids. While during his surgery, the Tokan Gosai Yakuza caught wind of the at-time rumor and hospitalized Murata. Fortunately, the surgery was a success. But Ricky Dozan went against the doctor's orders from drinking alcohol because the knife that stabbed him was soaked in urine beforehand. The chances of infection would increase if there is alcohol consumption. And during the following days after the surgery, Ricky Dozan was actually visited by Murata and his boss, who apologized and accepted responsibility for the incident they were forgiven. But the alcohol consumption would keep worsening Ricky Dozan's condition, and he went for a second surgery, but developed peritonitis, an inflammation of the abdomen that causes severe pain, and died on the table on December 15th, 1963. He was only 39 years old. With Ricky Dozan's passing, the JWA took a hiatus and began being run by a committee of wrestlers. 
This committee was led by one of Ricky Dozan's earlier and so far most accomplished students, Toyono Bori. The JWA Commission was four wrestlers, all trained by Ricky Dozan, and prepared to continue the future of Puro Resu. President Toyonobori, Vice President Yoshino Sato, and the two chairmen, Yoshimura Michiaki and Kokichi Endo. These four would debate on the direction of the promotion and its future stars. Toyonobori, in his mid-thirties, was undoubtedly the president of the JWA but the committee debated on who the future would be. Toyonobori wanted Kanji Anoki, but the other three wanted Shohei Baba. Kanji Anoki was born into a wealthy family in Yokohama in 1943, but his family would enter into financial hardships when his father died. The Anoki family would emigrate to Brazil where young Kanji would excel in athletics. Inoki would be scouted by the JWA, where he would be trained to be a pro wrestler. And due to his South American home, he was billed under the name of Antonio Inoki. In 1964, Inoki went on an excursion to the United States to hone his skills. During this time, he would start a friendship with Karl Gotch, a German Greco-Roman wrestler who went pro and was a global draw during the 1960s. This friendship would be very helpful in Anoki's future. Anoki would return to Japan in 1966, where his rival, Shohei Baba, was the ace. Shohei Baba was born a small child in 1938, but would suffer from gigantism. He would join his school's baseball team and make records as a pitcher. He would get picked by the Yomiuri Giants baseball team before he even finished high school in 1955 and was dominating the baseball field. Baba did have a weakness, and it was luck. He developed a brain tumor in 1957, and the success rate for the surgery back at that time was very low. The operation, though, was thankfully a success, and he continued to dominate baseball. But in 1960, he was acquired by the Tayo Whales, and during the off-season, he fell in the bathroom and crashed into his shower's glass door, which resulted in his left elbow having 17 stitches. Baba would join the JWA Dojo just a day apart from Anoki, and to add a garnish to this story, they both debuted on the same show. Enoki, like many wrestlers' debuts in Japan, are booked to lose as a lesson in humility and to gain dues from the audience who will watch the wrestlers' progression over the years. Meanwhile, Baba defeated a low-card veteran in his debut. Enoki and Baba's relationship over the next few years comes off like a rivalry in an anime. For most of the 60s, Baba would beat Enoki in every match they had against each other and Anoki felt that the JWA wasn't giving him what he felt was his due, and President Toyonobori agreed. Toyonobori was fed up of being outvoted by the rest of the committee, and would leave the promotion to create his own, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, with Anoki as his ace in 1966. Tokyo Pro unfortunately failed to rival the JWA, since they did not have the TV exposure talent that could produce great matches to compete with the JWA, and a good connection to foreign talent like the NWA. After one year, Tokyo Pro folded, and were left with the choices of either joining IWE, a newly made promotion, or going back to the JWA. Inoki swallowed his pride and returned and he would slowly emerge from Baba's shadow in his second run. Enoki and Baba became a tag team and would dominate the scene and would basically own the NWA international tag team titles. The JWA, who had television deals with Nippon TV, NTV, 
gained another deal with Nihon Educational Television, NET. These deals would split the show's airings, where NTV had the right to Baba's matches, while NET had the rights to Inoki's matches as an example of what each network had for their exclusivities. Inoki would grow frustrated at what felt like complacency, a lack of a drive. Inoki knew that the JWA needed to do something to compete with the rising rival IWE, and had an idea. Inoki promoted the idea of a cross-TV feud where he and Baba would be the main focus. Yoshino Sato, the new president since the Tokyo Pro departures, nixed the idea, stating that the TV deals were too recent to create a rivalry, and that the networks would never agree to it. Inoki was convinced that the JWA was doomed to failure, and began talking with the roster, including Baba, about a coup. The higher-ups cut word, and would fire Anoki in 1971. This action, though, would bring a terrible fate, as by 1972, Anoki declared that he was creating a new promotion, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and would steal numerous wrestlers and even trainees from the dojo to join his new roster. NET would even abandon the JWA for New Japan, and to make things worse, Shohei Baba would not renew his contract, and would declare his own promotion, All Japan Pro Wrestling, where he acquired a fraction of the remaining diluted roster, and the partnership with the NWA, and of course, the NTV television deal. The JWA had no television, no talent relations, and they would have their last ever event on April 19th. 1973, where after the closure, would be absorbed by All Japan Pro Wrestling. The JWA is the cornerstone for every wrestling promotion in Japan, and that respect has been delivered since its fall. Many tournaments in Japan, like the G1 Climax or the Real World Tag League, are influenced by the JWA's World Big League and World Tag League. Many promotions to this day continue the ideas of foreign partnerships and even excursions for their talent to hone their skills like what Inoki did, or even what Ricky Dozan did at the beginning of his career. And one of those titles that the JWA has, the All Asia Tag Team titles, currently still resides in All Japan Pro Wrestling and is the longest active championship in Japan being created all the way back in November 1955. If Pure Resu was Mesopotamian lore, Ricky Dozan was its Gilgamesh, and built an everlasting legacy for that region of the world, and is still felt to this day.